Uh, so the Faraday battery challenge is a, is a quick reminder. Uh, it was part of the government's industrial strategy initiative a few years ago with a view to exploit the opportunities in vehicle um, electrification um, for the benefit of UK industry. And one of the big opportunities there, as, as we're um, going to see, is in batteries. Uh, the government decided to commit about £275 million, pounds, and that's been increased slightly in three areas. Um, the, the building of, a, of an industrialisation centre, which is, is fairly unusual for the UK, um, a, essentially a, a large facility for doing um, pre-commercial production and, and manufacturing and to enable testing of new materials, new manufacturing processes um, for batteries at different scales, um, right up to um, lowish volume production. Um, investment through Innovate UK into UK supply chain on near to market innovation um, projects. And then investment in the research base to have industrially focused mission driven research and doing research that can feed through into UK industry. That's been funded by EPSRC and uh, given to the Faraday Institution, which is where I'm currently working as head of technology transfer, uh, which means uh, doing two things, trying to identify what the gaps are in industry for, for uh, research opportunities in batteries and then feeding through um, that research into the uh, UK battery supply chain as, as efficiently as possible with a view to uh, accelerating um, the breakthroughs that are made in the universities to benefit the UK um, in what is increasingly becoming a global race to you know, electrify transport and it looks like the Americans have very much joined that over recent weeks. Um, we've been going for two years as an institution, uh, we've committed the funding to the research groups, uh, we've published um, academic papers, but more importantly, we've got a stream th of, of patents coming through. We've set up entrepreneurial fellowships. Um, we've got uh, six prospective startup companies now, uh, two of which have got all the way through the startup and received commercial investments and are starting to um, do, do real business. Um, we're bringing together a community of researchers rather than just operating in their traditional small research groups. Um, we're trying to build a team across different institutions to, to deliver um, the overall benefits. And alongside that, put in place uh, training to, to build capability to feed through into the industrial research base and indeed the manufacturing research base. In doing that, we're working um, with, a, it's about 50 companies, but to 30 of those we're working with, uh, with very closely um, right across the, the battery supply chain. Um, from companies who, who are doing uh, materials, provision, um, coatings, uh, small, um, small scale uh, niche manufacture, um, right up to the companies who are opening big gigafactories such as AESC and, uh, and British Vault. So the, the research program, as I said, it's application inspired research. Um, the, the first set of, of projects that I just want to briefly mention are projects based on uh, lithium ion technology and moving that forward incrementally. Lithium te ion technology is being designed into the uh, car platforms of today and, and of tomorrow. There's a light that's be around for the next 50, 10 or 15 years. Um, there isn't any debate anymore. The, the vehicles that people are going to be able to buy in 2030 are going to have uh, large elements of, of battery technology in them and the battery technology that's in them is going to be lithium ion uh, because any other technology getting that to market that's, uh, that's sufficiently risk managed for the automotive industry is going to take longer than the five or ten years that we have available um, to, to get that through the prototyping certification and, and approval system into, into batteries. Uh, so we need to be working with uh, the lithium ion battery manufacturers to um, understand more about the way that that technology is developing and to help select the, the best supply chain to help build the supply chain and also to move that on incrementally, which, which means really working closely in partnership with, um, with the industry contacts that we have. We then have some projects looking at next generation battery chemistries 
uh, less interesting for this meeting, but uh, but still interesting nonetheless because there, there are potential big UK opportunities in sodium ion batteries, in solid state batteries, and in lithium sulfur batteries, and they're likely to come through in the next five to ten years and probably in probably be in vehicles um, by the by the mid 2030s, possibly sooner if you believe some of the um, hype that's coming out of the US with the solid state battery companies. Um, where they may be, uh, be available before before 2030. And then there's some cost cutting um, projects, uh, which are also potentially big opportunities as it starts to build in recycling, reuse, providing the physical infrastructure to the research base and in, in um, characterization techniques for batteries. That's, that's characterization both for the research community and characterization um, for the industrial opportunity to be able to and develop new products and, and control quality. Oops. Um, there's a big demand projected. We did some projected. We did some work with McKinsey and Oxford University, uh, looking at what the likely transfer would be over to electrification of vehicles. Um, this work was done two years ago. Since then, the electrification of vehicle fleet has been brought forward, and so this is probably a quite a conservative um, curve. Um, a, a gigafactory, uh, which is a very large scale um, battery factory, typically somewhere between 10 and 30 gigawatt hours a year, um, possibly up as high as a, a terawatt hour of batteries per year, um, if you're looking at the next generation of Tesla factories. Uh, but we're likely to need a handful of gigafactories in the UK. Uh, we've got um, the one big gigafactory that, that's been announced by uh, by British Fault in the northeast and there's likely to be some more coming coming through the through the system. Why are batteries important? Um, about 40% of the value of an electric vehicle uh, comes in the battery system. Uh, so if if the UK is going to continue to be dominant for dominant force in the automotive industry, then having that battery supply chain is going to be fundamental to um, what is a very large proportion of the current UK battery so what is currently a UK, a large proportion of UK industry. And this, the opportunity in the supply chain was highlighted in the report back in April 2019 uh, from the Advanced Propulsion Centre. Um, if you want to be uh, really familiar with, um, with what that supply chain opportunity looks like, uh, this is a really great support, um, report breaking it down. I'm going to cover some of the highlights from, the, from that report in the rest of this presentation. Um, it's available for download from the um, Advanced Propulsion Centre, which is apcuk.com. Um, so you can you can access that directly online. Uh, there are companies uh, that have been set up in the UK, such as uh, such as Anti Power, and um, that's the parent company of AGM Batteries, which was one of the uh, one of the first battery companies that was that was set up in the. Um, early 1990s as battery technology, specifically lithium battery technology was becoming commercial um, to, to meet the needs of, of niche markets. Um, and so they, they'll have some uh, supply chain already existing, but they're, they're looking at uh, expanding and expanding big time. And one of the limiting factors that's holding them back on their expansion is getting the right chemical supply chain in place um, to, to get the investment to them build uh, build out their battery capacity and there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation going on if we talk to Anti and, and, and their suppliers and that they're, they're looking to, they're, they're looking to invest in, in battery manufacture their suppliers are looking to um, invest in scaling up the, the chemical supply chain and uh, really those two things needed to need to be um, done together and um, the Nissan factory in Sunderland was, was the first EV fa battery factory in Europe uh, running at two gigawatt hours per annum up until two or three years ago. Um, it was it was by some margin the largest battery manufacturer in Europe. They've been quietly ticking away um, in the northeast of England. Uh, it's good to see that AESC, or Vision AESC, who's the parent company, have recently invested that they're wanting to invest in expanding that facility to supply Nissan with the next generation of vehicles. And this is particularly interesting for us because 
that next generation of vehicles is using the next generation of, 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 um, of battery chemistries. And those battery chemistries are more sensitive to oxygen, to moisture, and have a shorter shelf life, which means that supply chain has to be shortened. So that's, what, uh, that's really opening up the opportunity for UK supply chain, because uh, for many of the chemicals that are going into those batteries, the supply chain is in Japan and it's being shipped overseas. Um, and that will be that will be much more difficult to do in the, in the future. Um, so so I'm I'm confident that they're going to be looking uh, more and more at the UK supply chain. Uh, and then of course the the announcements from um, British Vault also looking to um, open a large factory in the northeast, and they're going to be wanting to build the supply chain as, as they as they go through doing that. And um, alongside the factory building what they're calling the infinity center, which is their recycling capability, which is going to be looking at the, um, the chemical supply chain in recycling as well as in manufacture. Um, in attracting uh, battery companies to the UK, um, this, is a, this is a slide that was put together by UK um, trade and investments. And one of the factors that is needed to build that capability is going to be a strong chemical industry to build out that supply chain in batteries. Um, this slide is is an extract from the uh, from the APC report, and it, it's an extract that's covering battery manufacture. Um, in green are all the processes that you would typically have in a in a large um, gigafactory, and in blue, all the way around the outside, are the opportunities for for supply chain. So everything from basic metals, um, high purity coppers um, rolled into foils, um, high purity aluminium rolled into foils. Um, the cathode active materials, the often forgotten about solvents, additives in binders that's needed to mix those things together, and the techniques involved in the formulation, in the mixings and the coatings, um, the, the anode materials, the films that are needed to, to pack the batteries, um, the separators, which are a, 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 an organic um, material. Um, which is typically coated with a ceramic of some sort um, and the, the, the various coatings and the techniques of those coatings that go in that, um, the, the electrolytes um, and the carriers for the electrolytes, so, so the solvents such as, as DME and the electrolytes such as um, lithium possible fluoride, um, all need to then feed into the, to that factory and, and all create uh, really substantial opportunities. The majority of the majority of the cost now that's going into cell manufacture uh, is now those materials and are split down by by cost, uh, which is fairly widely available, um, is interesting. These, these are these are multi-billion dollar industries. The the cathode material by itself in the UK is a is a five billion dollar opportunity. Um, and so you, you can back calculate for, for the other materials. The, these are multi-billion opportunities or certainly hundreds of million um, pound opportunities um, for each one of those um, potential chemicals that, that's feeding into the battery supply chain. Breaking that down again um, from the biggest elements um, and the cathode active materials, <clears throat> feeding into that uh, are, are the raw materials um, such, such as the iron ores that, that are available um, from, from the mining industries and the, the UK has headquarters of some of the biggest mining companies in the world, feeding through to, to those precursors, so that initial processes in mining and some of the, um, some of the biggest nickel refineries in Europe are in, um, are in the UK, in fact I think the, the largest is in South Wales, uh, which is then feeding, feeding through into the into the form, formulation and the, the stirred reactors to, to produce uh, the cathode active material, uh, which then has to be formulated in a way to, to have the right sort of um, physical and, and chemical structures and um, to go into the, the next step, which is the, the, which is the coating technology. Um, not, not forgetting um, companies like Solvay, uh, which is a, a binder um, provider and the binder that's holding these materials together can can play can play quite a large part in the um, in the overall performance of the battery. Surprisingly, <laughs> so um, when these materials come in and, and uh, they're mixing they're mixed together, 
Um, I don't have to tell the the audience um, here that, uh, that ju just the um, the raw engineering challenges in in taking these these ceramic materials, mixing them into inks, uh, and putting them onto metal substrate coatings can be challenging itself, and the the various um, problems and issues in doing that. And when when you look through these issues, um, anyone who has a coatings or or a paints or an inks background. Uh, will recognise that these are common issues that the UK chemical companies um, have lots of experience in addressing and uh, addressing those. And so we're looking to to UK chemicals, coatings, um, and indeed pharmaceuticals and food industries, um, how they solve this in working together to to produce a better current generation electrodes and um, more high performance uh, next generation electrodes. Uh, so we have a project uh, within the institution called the Next Road Project, which is short for next generation electrodes. And, and it's, it's going back to the fundamental science of what makes a good electrode, how should it be structured, how, how um, should you optimize the, um, the porosity, the particle size, um, and can that can that um, electrode be made using alternative manufacturing techniques to produce a graded electrode? The initial modeling that's been, that's been done on that shows there's maybe a 30% a improvement in performance that's achievable uh, by having a, a graded electrode that's manufactured in a slightly different way. Uh, that 30% performance improvement is, is equivalent to having a 30% throughput improvement in a, in a battery factory, which when you're investing multi-billion dollars in, in that factory in the supply chain, um, producing that, that next generation electrodes uh, essentially uh, will allow a big step change, reduction in cost or, uh, or improvement in profit there. So the sort of things that, that needs to um, be done on that is um, looking at the materials design, looking at the coatings design of particles, um, looking at making more consistent and engineered uh, particle sizes, building those into slurries and inks, and looking at alternative ways of, of getting those coatings um, onto materials um, and they're things that I'm sure that the UK chemicals industry has some experience with. Uh, and finally I want to draw your attention to uh, the advanced propulsion sensor technology roadmap uh, which which sets out um, what the areas of development are likely to be over the next five or ten years and so looking at things um, like alternative chemistries to get ultra low cost cathodes and test those to see how they work. Um, looking at how to optimize the, the particles and, and blend those into, into new materials. Looking at improving the performance, looking at improving the separators and the chemistry of the separators um, to, to help build those next generation cells. And they're things that our research community, our innovation community and existing industry um, may have really good solutions to already that can be trialled out using the facilities available at, at UK BIC uh, to help the UK become a leading battery manufacturer. And that's my time. Thank you very much for listening on the assumption that everybody wants. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, right. Uh, so um, I think that, that sort of summarises the, the, the sort of scale and the sorts of opportunities uh, that are coming up. I, what we're going to do next is uh, hopefully Reese is on the line. If he could turn on his yes, yes. Oh, yeah, I can see him. Are you in UK or Japan yet, Reese? In the UK currently. Okay, right, fine. Uh, so if you want to start sharing your slides, uh, Reese has been involved in the, the so called rules of origin uh, negotiations. And I think it's important because you've heard about the opportunity. There's also an imperative which is going to come out in, in Reese's talk about how quickly we have to make some of these things work to, as, as, as Ian said, remain credible and, and, and competitive within the automotive market. So with that, I will hand over to Rhys. Great. So as David said, my name is Rhys Isaac. I was one of the lead negotiators on the UK, Japan FTA, the EU, UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. I led on the rules of origin negotiations and specifically on cars and electric batteries. That was sort of my bag. Um, and a lot of this follows on from what uh, Ian has said, which is really helpful. Um, but just give you a quick, quick overview again. Um, so the reason why this issue is big is because 
eight in 10 UK cars are exported. We only buy two of them out of the 10. And as Ian has said, and others will say as well, the sort of acceleration of growth in electric vehicles is really fast. Um, and the take up across the globe really is expected to be really fast. And, uh, you know, from my conversations with number 10 and the prime minister and so on, all I can tell you is that the prime minister and the business secretary, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, both see this as a huge strategic priority for the government. So there's significant backing and significant political interest in this over the next couple of years. And as Ian has mentioned as well, why are batteries so important to an electric vehicle? Because the conventional powertrain in a normal vehicle is much lower value, whereas the powertrain, and what I mean by a powertrain, is the motor, the inverter, and the battery. Them three components can make up to 50% of the value of an electric vehicle. So you think of a Nissan Leaf, that's £29,000, roughly about £14,000 of that vehicle is these three products. And the problem we have now is because we've left the customs union and we've set the free trade agreement, imports and exports are liable for tariffs. And the only way to get around a tariff is through a rule of origin. And usually for cars, there is around a 50% value add requirement, which means that 50% of the product has to be produced in the UK or the EU. Obviously, that is a real challenge for cars when 50% of the product potentially is non-originating just from the powertrain. So the chances are most of the cars that we make uh, wouldn't meet a normal rule of origin, which is why we had to look at the battery rules and in particular how a battery is made to make sure that we can qualify a battery as originating in free trees and therefore get your Leafs and your BMW E-Mini and et cetera over the line. Um, just to give you a bit of a, an overview on this as well, this is the sort of scale of the issue currently. 97% of the battery packs and the chemicals, to be honest, the refined chemicals, all come from East Asia. Only 1% of demand in 2018 was done by European businesses. And I imagine within that 1%, the large majority of that was probably Envision AEC, which is Nissan supplier uh, in Northeast. So the aim, to give you a bit of context as well, uh, the commission, and as part of this free trade agreement, what they really want to drive forward is flipping this global uh, visual the other way around. That's what they want to try and do. Obviously, there are some scepticism about that, but what the EU and the UK, to be fair, both want to do is become fairly self-sufficient in battery production by around 2027. The EU will probably do it quicker than us because there's more manpower, but the UK is looking at that sort of date as the self-sufficiency point. Because it's important to stress that it's not just about the EU market. We will be selling cars globally. We do sell cars globally. Roughly 40% of our exports are to the rest of the world in cars. So this is relevant for all types of car exports. And the, this process map uh, splits out in a bit more of a simpler way uh, how you make a battery pack. Um, and there are, you know, as, as you can see from Ian's previous slide, the APC sort of green, blue, huge block. There are lots of different steps within this, but this is the sort of slide that I use with the commission and others to try and convince them of how you make a battery pack and how it all works. And this has been validated by the APC, lots of car companies, and most of the car other battery manufacturers. But just to give you a quick overview of how a battery pack is made, and this is where it'll be interesting for you guys. Step one is where the main activity happens. That's where all the raw materials get gathered, the solvents, et cetera, binding, and they get put together to make the slurry or what is known as the powders. And once you've got the slurry or powder, you get your aluminium foils, huge sheets of it, and you coat them with the cathode and the anode. Once you've done that, they turn into what's called an electrode. And basically what happens then is these huge foils get discharged and rolled up, and then they get sent into Europe. And currently these three steps, they all happen in, predominantly they happen in Asia. But as you can see in the bottom corner, that's roughly 67% of the value of a battery pack. So 
all the processing that happens following the, the manufacture of the electrode, it adds a very small value in compared to what's done when you first make the electrodes. And once you've got these big foils that are coated with the active cathode material, the active anode material, they then get cut to size, these little foils, and then you make a cell. And basically it's anode separated cathode cell housing. That's pretty much it. You shoot a bit of electrolyte in there as well, and that's pretty much it. Once you get your cells together, you do you start to do a process of called aging, which basically you just leave them stack and you allow the chemicals to go through the, the, the cell. And once that's done alongside the charging, you put the individual cells into what's called a module. Eight or more is a module. And then once the modules are complete, you put the modules in the battery housing system and you ship the battery housing system to uh, the OEM who dumps it in the car. That's pretty much the process. Obviously, from you guys, you pretty much care about steps one and two. The rest is over to the, the other parts of the supply chain. But just to break that down in a bit more detail for you, and this is slightly different. Uh, I think the calcs are slightly different to what Ian showed, but it's still the same picture. Um, and this is a NMC811 battery. It's a mainstream battery that uh, Invision, for example, will be manufacturing, and a lot of other battery manufacturers will be manufacturing as well. Um, and the basics you want to take away from this is how important the chemical materials are to the makeup of the product. And you can see here that cathode materials make up 30% of the value of a pack. Um, if you look at a cell, uh, just the cell part, it makes up even more, around 45% of the value of the cell. Um, and as you can see going down the list, the, the values get smaller. But the real point is the cathode and the anode mixture uh, and they're sort of the other parts that you need to sort of bind them together, it gives a grand total of around 44% uh, to a battery pack. Now, this figure will vary and it will fluctuate depending on how good your chemistry makeup is and can you drop the value down, but generally that is how much uh, value is generated in a pack. And as you can see in the second stage, uh, once the European manufacturers get these electrodes, this is what they do. They cut them, they make the cells, they age them, charge them, put them in a battery pack and then send them to the OEM. This part is basically what the European and UK battery manufacturers are doing currently. They're not making the electrode uh, part. Or some are, but at a very, very, very small volume. Um, and it's important to stress that the change between getting from here to doing this part of the supply chain, the EU and the UK both want this to start happening around 2024. So that's when a lot of the battery manufacturers start to come online, like in North Fault's British Fault and so on, or trying to anyway. And alongside that, that's where the cathode producers will start to line up with them. And the hope is that we can start to take more of this part of the product process uh, in the UK and in the EU, because that will add the value to the car overall. So rules of origin is really complicated. And these are the rules for uh, cars and batteries in the, first, in the first six years of the agreement. And the reason why we've done a transitional period for electrified vehicles and batteries is because of what I just said, the supply chain is there in the UK or the EU at the minute, it's quite shallow, it's in development, and there's a huge reliance on the East Asian market until we get our own sort of self-sufficient supply chains up and running. So what we agreed with the EU was we do a six-year transitional period where we would basically phase up the rules. They get progressively more restrictive as more localization activity happens over this timeline. And generally speaking, there are three ways to do rules of origin. There is either a value add option. So, you know, you have to have a certain amount of local content to pass the rule, or there's a change in tariff classification option, which is the simplest way of saying is your inputs have to be different to the output, but there is no, there's no, uh, there's no depth description or uh, requirement on value add. You could have 10% value, you could have 90% value. There's no debt requirement for that, providing the inputs are a different kind of classification to the output, good to go. 
And the other, the third option, which is more common, common in the chemical industry, is specific, the specific processing rule. And whereas with you guys, you've got things like distillation, mixing, that type of thing, for batteries, it is just a simple assembly rule. Um, so there are three different types of rules for batteries. Um, and it's important to stress that they get progressively more restrictive from 2024. But I'll explain this in very quickly in a couple of slides. So to, to get, so if Invision, for example, let's use Invision with the Leaf, uh, Nissan Leaf, for them to qualify a sell or pack in the first period, 2021 to 2023, they only need to generate 30% value if they want to use this option. And as you can see on the slide, they would make 33% value by bringing in non-originating electrodes and making the cells themselves. So in the first phase, there's no requirement to have this originating cathode or anode. They can carry on using uh, Chinese East Asian inputs. For a cell, it's slightly different because the rule for a cell is very much more restrictive than the rule for a cell or pack if you want to use the value add option. I won't go into too much detail on this, but it basically means that because the way you manufacture a battery cell or pack, the tariff code only changes heading, so four digit change, once when you get the chemicals, the metals, you coat them, they go from the chemicals chapter and the metals chapter into the machinery chapter, electrodes. That's the only point at which uh, a change in tariff heading occurs. So to meet the rule for a cell in phase one, if you wanted to use a change in tariff heading option, you would have to start a step two and coat the foils yourselves, but you can use non-originating uh, cathode and anode. There's no requirement on that. Going back to the packs, which is what most people make, um, currently anyway, the CTSH option is slightly more liberal than the CTH option. So CTH is changing tariff heading, which means you've got to move at a four digit level. Whereas the CTSH option is a change in tariff subheading, which means that you can still work within the, within the heading, providing you change subheading. And the way this works is that you get your coated electrodes, so you've got the chemicals, you put them on the foils. Then they are in 850790, the tariff classification. When you make the cell, they change to 850760. That's a change in sub bedding rule. So that's how that rule works. The final rule in the, in the first phase is the most liberal, and it basically allows you to bring in all non originating materials and just assemble the cells at the last process. Uh, basically making mod assembling the pack battery pack from non-originating modules. So there's no requirement for chemicals there. Where it all changes is in 2024 and the rules get much more restrictive on what battery and cell manufacturers can do uh, going forward. And the difference really is the cathode element. And both the UK and the EU see cathode production as a strategic priority, it has to be localized, we have to get it going. The EU wanted to be more prescriptive in how we did it. I wasn't very comfortable with that, but we lost the argument. And what it basically means is, if you wanna make a cell or a pack in, from 2024 onwards, if you wanna use the change in tariff heading option, which doesn't require any sort of value to be met, it only requires you to change the tariff heading, you still have to start a step two, so Invision, for example, or Norfolk, would still have to coat the foils themselves. But whereas in the last period, they could use uh, non-originating cathode, they have to use local cathode to coat the foils. There is no allowance on using East Asian or Chinese produced cathode. It has to be manufactured within the free trade area for you to use this rule and the battery manufacturers will be asked for proof that they have used local cathode if they apply this rule. And that's for cell and pack in the, in the next, in the second phase. The, the other option for battery manufacturers is uh, to use a value add option. And as you can see here, with a pack in the second phase, because there's only 36% value in the processing alone of a pack, 
you need to find another 24% value in your materials. From a battery manufacturer's perspective, if you can remember the first slide I showed you on the breakdown, it's probably going to be a lot easier to localize the cathode. So if you look at this slide, two seconds, it's a lot, I need to get 24% from this. So it's probably a lot easier if I localize the cathode rather than localizing everything else. Now, obviously that's a very simple way of putting it, um, but, and probably there'll be an element of mixing both, but you can see how important cathode is, both in the CTH option and also meeting the max, the value add option, the 60% option for the batteries. They really need to get that cathode localized or localize pretty much everything else down to the nuts and bolts. And the same thing applies to the cell, but you get a 50% requirement instead of a 60% requirement. And the same principle applies. You might not need to localize the cathode, but in practice, you probably do need to localize the cathode. You can do it without the cathode, but you need to localize the nuts, the bolts, the separate, the anode, the, uh, not the anode, the electrodes, everything else pretty much, which is gonna be a challenge. Then when you go to the final stage, so the end rules going forward, the value add option, the way it's designed for both cell and pack, it means that you've got to hit 70% value on a pack or 65% value on a cell. That's impossible to do without adding the cathode to your locally sourced materials. But that, and that is based on the NMC811 battery, as Ian pointed out, if the world changes and the chemical mix comes down, there might be more flexibility for the battery manufacturers. But over the next seven, I would go even further to say 15 years, it's not going to happen because the contracts that OEMs, car manufacturers are putting in place are for these type of batteries. So the next seven, 10 years at least, we'll be looking at that type of makeup. And going back to what I said, it means that roughly around, you basically have to localize the cathode. Um, so that's, that's the rules. Um, and this is the, uh, the rules for the cars. The thing to just note here is that there is more flexibility for cars in the first and second phase, but in the third phase going forward, back cars, so plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles, regardless of how much local content they'll have in them, they must also have an originating battery as well. So they can obviously count that as part of the local content or they can choose not to, but that just brings it back to the importance of getting the cathode producers lined up with the battery manufacturers and getting that contract with the OEM because by 2027, there will be no choice. They have to source locally produced cathode to make an originating battery and therefore sell a car into the EU tariff free. Um, I'll stop there. I appreciate I went through that super fast. Um, but I'll stop there. I imagine there'll be questions later on. Right. Thank you very much, Rhys. Uh, for those of you who... Uh, uh, for those of you who, who, who didn't take notes, this is being recorded and will be available afterwards. But that's a very complicated sort of set of circumstances. But the bottom line is, oh, my God, we've got to make the batteries in the UK or we're screwed. So um, that's 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 that. It's, We'll have a, a few few Q and A's at the end. Uh, if you have a question, put it into the the chat room or something. There there are people who've been in. Uh, Isabel's been in to put out that uh, Reese Reese misnamed uh, uh, British Vault and other people are putting sort of what they do in the chat room. So please go look there. But uh, now it's time for the third talk, and it's Lucy Crane from Cornish Lithium. So Lucy, would you like to share your screen and your video and explain the fact that Cornwall is actually a source of lithium? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. My name's Lucy Crane. I am a geologist at Cornish Lithium, but I also work on the kind of innovation collaborations that we do and business development as well. So to start with, I want to kind of try and drive home this point. We've been talking about the need for gigafactories here in the UK and how the rules of origin actually mean that the time to act is now. But I want to think almost right to the upstream part of the supply chain. Where are we actually going to get all of these raw materials from? And how important is the mining industry? There's a phrase 
that if something hasn't been grown, it's been mined. And I think that's really important. Everything we use in our daily lives, whether that's your smartphone, which now typically contains two thirds of the elements from the periodic table within it, whether that's the houses we live in, the cars we drive, whether they're combustion engine or electric vehicles, whether it's an exit on a motorway, there's not just a little hill there, it's been built up by aggregate. Everything that we come across in our daily lives has been extracted from the ground pretty much in one way or another. And mining really is key to our daily lives. And it's something that we probably haven't really given much thought to here in Europe for the last couple of decades. It's been something that we've been very happy to export out to other parts of the world. We've had this very, I think it's fair to say NIMBY, not in my backyard attitude to mining. If somebody mentioned that they were going to open a mine down the road from your house, for example, you'd probably be worried about big trucks and you might picture it being really polluting. And I don't know, normally when people ask you to picture a mine, you might picture somebody down a coal mine or covered in dirt, or you might think of mining tailings dams collapse, you know, when those kind of disasters have made the national and international news. Or you might think of the fact that I think over 65% of the world's cobalt currently comes from the DRC, the not so democratic Republic of Congo. So you can be pretty sure that your mobile phone is more likely to contain cobalt that's been extracted by a potential child miner or the proceeds of which are actually going to fund conflict in the region. So mining generally is something that we kind of associate with, it's something a bit dirty, it's something that happens in other parts of the world and actually we're happy that it happens in other parts of the world because it means that we don't have to deal with the immediate impacts of it. But my question to you is actually if in places such as Europe we've got supplies of minerals which are going to be so key to fueling our energy transition. We've got supplies of things such as lithium, there's potential for cobalt, we've got potential for graphite in parts of Europe, Surely it makes more sense to actually extract these closer to home where we can make sure that the mines are being, you know, operated to high environmental standards. We make we know that the workers are going to be paid fairly and actually we're taking responsibility for the impact of all of the things that we're consuming. And actually, as we move through this energy transition away from our reliance on fossil fuels, we need to mine more metals than we ever have done in the past. There's a fantastic report that came out by the World Bank last year. It's got some mind boggling stats in it and it's called Minerals for Climate Action, the Mineral Intensity of the Clean Energy Transition. One of the things it highlights is just to, just to put into context for you quite how much raw materials we need to mine. In the last 5,000 years, humanity has mined about 550 million tonnes of copper. The World Bank estimate that we need to mine that same amount of copper in the next 25 years purely for its use in low carbon technologies. So recycling is so important and we really need to be building a circular economy in as far as we possibly can, but we cannot ignore the fact that we are going to need a significant amount of raw materials. If you take into consideration that on average in the mining industry, it can take 10 years from finding something to actually extracting that commercially, then with these rules of origin, we need access to a lot of raw materials to help us, you know, to actually feed stock into these battery mega factories and gigafactories. So the mining industry has got a hell of a job to do in the next few years if we're going to be able to find new deposits. Because the scale of the amount of minerals that we need is just so massive and on a scale that we haven't really seen before, because in the first industrial revolution, yes, we use things like steel and copper, but actually, as we invent more and more high tech technologies, we've got low carbon technologies such as wind turbines and batteries, and we're using a whole suite of metals that we haven't necessarily mined that much in the past. So there are still some in circulation. We know geologically where to find them, but actually sometimes the easy to find deposits are already being worked. We can ramp up production in these mines that are already churning out lots of copper, lots of iron, lots of lithium, but we also need to find new deposits, which means that we need to look in places that are perhaps deeper undercover. They might be hidden under 100 or 200 meters of bedrock on top of them, or they might be further into the desert and further away from infrastructure and amenities, meaning it's going to be more expensive to extract them. 
or perversely, we need to start looking closer to home again and stop exporting our impact of extracting these minerals. Europe has really great mineral deposits. We've just been much happier to let other people take responsibility for extracting them and just using the products ourselves. I think a typical three megawatt wind turbine contains five tonnes of copper wiring in it, two tonnes of rare earth elements, it's made out of 1200 tonnes of concrete. Like this energy transition is going to be really significant. And so, yeah, and I think what we've seen in the last 12 months as well is actually how dependent we are on international supply chains for these things. And we're seeing potentially coupled with Brexit, an increasing drive to see what we can produce closer to home. So this map on the left is a couple of years, well, four years out of date now, which is ridiculous, but it's still pretty much true. And it shows where lithium is currently produced around the world. And you can see that most of the world's lithium either comes from these brines, these salar brine deposits in South America, or from a hard rock source in West Australia. And these, we understand where they form, we understand how to extract the lithium from these. But what's really interesting about this map, and I think what's key to note, is actually the lack of any significant primary production from North America, from Europe, from Africa, or from Asia. And, you know, looking at this little chart on the right hand side, it shows that actually, and again, this is a few years out of date now, China produced over 50% of the world's lithium chemicals yet they're only producing less than 10% of the primary supply. And that's because so many mines will produce a mineral concentrate on site, but then they'll ship that mineral concentrate to China because China's got the capacity to refine those into battery quality chemicals. That has an associated fairly significant carbon footprint. So that's another argument for seeing if we can extract some of these minerals from deposits within Europe, North America, for example. So that's all well and good. Why are we looking in Cornwall? Well, Cornwall's got this amazing history of mining tin and mining copper, dating back at least 5,000 years. Um, but it's actually also really pretty much enriched in lithium. But the first lithium ion battery was commercialised in what, 1991 or 1992. And actually the last metal mine, the last tin mine in Cornwall was closed by 1997. Nobody was really looking for lithium when they were exploring the 60s and the 70s and the 80s because there wasn't really a use for it. This is a map from the US Geological Survey, and apologies because the resolution is not that great, but you can see that there are red blocks all over it, and these are where you get rich seams, these pegmatite deposits of lithium minerals. Um, you get these rich veins of lithium that can be mined. In contrast, in Cornwall, we are one of five yellow blobs that they've highlighted and rather than us having rich veins of lithium in Cornwall the whole county is underlain by this big mass of lithium enriched granite so it's the bulk rock that's enriched in lithium. What does this look like? Well you can orientate your heads and use a decent amount of imagination. That red blob is what this we call it a granite batholith, it's a big like pluton that sits underneath the southwest and it forms all of the topographic highs in the area. So we've got Dartmoor in the east through to Bodmin Morse and Austell where the China clay industry is still very active all the way out to Land's End in the Isles of Scilly and that's where this granite pokes out on the surface but it's all joined up at depth it's a bit like the Loch Ness Monster and this granite is important for two reasons it's enriched in lithium but actually it's also hot so there's potential for geothermal energy down here this map on the left is a heat flow map from the British Geological Society and it shows that literally there is a hot spot on the southwest and that coincides with where we find the granite. There are actually a couple of deep geothermal power projects underway in Cornwall where I've put the two X's, one at a place called United Downs and one at the Eden project where they're about to start drilling. So here they're looking to actually generate geothermal power and electricity from the hot waters that circulate at depth. These hot waters have actually been known to contain lithium for, well, since 1864. So this map on the left, well, section on the left hand side, you can see little engine houses on the top. And if you've ever been to Cornwall, you'll see that the county is dotted with these engine houses. And they were there because they contained big pumps. And these pumps let you artificially dewater the mine. So what they do is they pump out water lowering the water table artificially, which means that they can mine to deeper and deeper depth. And they're mining these steeply dipping narrow seams of tin and of copper. 
some of that water that they are pumping out is meteoric, so it's kind of rainwater that's fallen on the top and percolates down. But in Cornwall, a fairly significant amount of that water that they were pumping out was this geothermal waters, these hot springs that used to plague the deep mines. They could be 45, 50 degrees Celsius flow at consistent, fairly high rates for the 30 years that that mine was being worked. And in 1864, Professor Miller from King's College in London came and took some samples of these hot springs from, from this exact place, United Mines, and did some test work and said, actually, these hot springs could be a potential source of lithium. They're remarkably enriched in lithium. If only we had a use for it. So fast forward 160 years, and here we are. And so we are exploring for lithium contained within these geothermal waters, but we're also looking at the potential to produce lithium from the granite rock itself as well. I'm very aware of time, so I can go into much more detail about the actual geology later. But the thing to keep in mind is, if you think of a granite work surface in a kitchen, it's pretty solid. It's not very permeable. And that's why we're focused on extracting lithium from the big geological faults that exist in Cornwall. So these are kind of natural cracks in the Earth's crust. And that's where we've got natural permeability that lets these geothermal waters flow at depth. They're flowing through the granite, they're warming up, and they're also leaching lithium out of the granite and into solution. We've done some drilling to test this concept that there are permeable geological structures that contain warm water and it's got lithium in. That's excellent. Um, and we're actually looking at utilizing a whole new suite of technologies called direct lithium extraction technologies to allow us to hopefully produce a lithium hydroxide battery quality product directly on site here in Cornwall. And that's probably still three to five years away on commercial scale, but we're actually just starting to build a pilot plant for this now. In parallel, we're looking at the potential to produce lithium from the granite itself and Yes, this is more akin to traditional mining, you know, extracting lithium from geothermal waters via boreholes is very environmentally responsible. If you can use that geothermal heat energy to power your lithium extraction plant, then that's got the opportunity for you to produce lithium in a net zero carbon manner. Yes, looking for lithium in hard rock is more akin to traditional mining, but it so happens to be that the parts of Cornwall where there is the most potential to produce lithium from hard rock coincide with existing China clay pits. So we would look to go into China clay pits that are no longer being used. And we would effectively, as you produce China clay, you actually concentrate up the lithium rich minerals. So they're really complementary processes, we think. And then just to finish, we actually have just finished a project which was funded by the Faraday Batch Challenge. It was called Lithium for the UK. It was only a small feasibility study. It was supposed to be 12 months, but was extended to 18 months because of COVID. And it was Cornish Lithium, Wardell Armstrong, who are mining consultants, and the Natural History Museum. And we looked at, is it going to be viable to produce lithium in the UK for the UK battery industry? And basically, our summaries suggest that it is. There's a lot of geological potential down here. Yes, they're new deposit types. They've previously been thought of as unconventional, but new technologies and new extraction technologies mean that these deposits really can be unlocked now. Is this totally mad? Well, no. Producing lithium from geothermal waters is being looked at in other parts of the world, and it really does seem to be the potentially the most environmentally responsible way that you can produce lithium. Um, the fact that we've got potential here down in Cornwall is something that we really do need to explore. So thank you very much for listening to me and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy. So what we're gonna do now is we, you know, we've talked at you, we, we've told you what we know. We're gonna go as we did last time into some syndicate sessions where we're gonna ask you, is this what's useful? for growing the supply chain. The goal of all of us is to, to grow uh, a UK-based uh, supply chain, uh, which can you know, answer the, the needs of the, that Ian and Reese articulated and that Lucy has start, you know, shown there's an example of those things. But what we're now trying to do is, is answer your questions in, in uh, sort of about the process but also ask you what we can do to help you more. We, we only got, got through the first two slides. So, uh, you know, quite a lot of discussion around the broad supply chain uh, and getting that balance of, of you know, the, the, what we call economics and performance of, of, the, of the business. Uh, some very good discussion around the appropriate legislation framework that, that uh, we may need. So, um, 
the EU has already got some legislation in, in place there. And then the question would be, should, should the UK do something very similar um, or, or potentially diverge? That there are, there are ways of uh, you know, going either way to really provide that overall framework, which was appropriate for the, uh, for the UK. We also talked about things like you know, competitiveness. Uh, and and I, think, um, I think it was either Ian or, or John, there may be some data out there that we can share to the um, more widely. And then clearly the, uh, you know, the need to have this collaborative ecosystem, which is why we're here today to, to, to do the risk. Um, and then on the rules of origin, you know, the, the, you know, having, you know, responsible sourcing materials and appropriate traceability coming back to that, to that framework were, was some, some very good themes that we, we discussed. So then that's one minute on that slide and then one minute, minute uh, on the next one. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, so here, you know, about the scale up and one of the things that came out here, it, it's, a, it's very ambitious, it's growing at, at a very significant rate. Um, and therefore, you know, the skills which we have identified before, but we come down a little bit lower down the slide into the specific ones, um, you know, are certainly a challenge to, to do that. So making sure we've got all the capabilities in place, you know, to move the speed of the, um, the expansion that we need to go through. Um, was it was important. We also had a quite an interesting discussion around technology um, and, and IP, making sure that that's available. And, and, and I think a, a key point was sometimes we just need to, need to use the best available technology, if it's UK based or not, um, but making sure we're obviously free to do that from an IP perspective. Uh, and then we started to get into the area of recycling, clearly something very important um, and how we do that. Um, you know, making sure that we really think that through in the most effective way for the end of life management, um, that we have some appropriate capacity and, and policy around that. Uh, and actually there's things that we can learn from other industries and we can, we can read across um, into, the, into this space. So I think that was the short summary. Obviously we'll circulate these slides around once we've been yeah, that with everybody. So I'll, I'll just add, add a, a, a caveat to that because we, we, we didn't record what we said about this slide because <clears throat> we went through it rather quickly. But the balance between the scale up at speed, which is what we do, we take the existing technologies, we try and implement them as quickly as possible with the bottom one, which is the next generation, because uh, a number of people in our area uh, sort of make bits that go into other people's bits. So they want to know where the overall technology package is going, because there's no point developing a material if it's not going to be used in the next generation of, of cells. So I think the balance between uh, the, the scale up at speed and the next generation technology was something that we, we, we mentioned in, you know, quite a lot of discussion. Yeah, we okay. came up there about, we, we captured that under future proofing, making sure exactly the same reason, let's make sure yeah. that whenever we're developing stuff now and, you know, the process is suitable for that. So yeah, we, we came with the same point, David. Okay, and we got recycling as well, a lot towards the end. Uh, so essentially, I guess one, one of the things that we, we started off talking about was the, the UK supply chain and the fact that it needs you know, the whole end-to-end -end nature of it, particularly related back to the, the raw materials. So, you know, we, we had extremes in the group in the sense of Lucy from the perspective of getting lithium out of the ground and Isabel with respect to cell manufacture. And, you know, the, so we, we had a, a conversation around the fact that all of these steps need to be, need to be linked and we need to look at all of the, the conversion processes within it. Um, I think within Rules of Origin, um, along with the stuff that's on the screen at the moment, we also talked about the, the criticality of life cycle analysis, which I think you know, was a, a point that Lucy handled very nicely within the, uh, within the lithium presentation and the, the requirements going forward to make sure that that's built into the, uh, you know, you, the Rules of Origin is important, but when we look at the end customer here, be it the cell manufacturer or be it the OEM, they are looking to minimize the, 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 the carbon footprint of the whole product. So there's, there's a number of things that we need to get right there um, and some good opportunities for, you know, for anything that we can do locally, obviously. Here we spent quite a bit of our time on testing and standards and the importance of this so that people at each stage of the supply chain can do a, a, a valid apples to apples comparison. And Isabel in particular, you know, made a couple of points around the way that this has happened on cell manufacture in the past tended to be through a series of conversations that took quite a long period of time. And one of the one of the things that we wondered coming out of this is, you know, it would be ideal if the OEMs were to could, could agree 
the standards, both for the testing protocols and also the way that the data is present presented. So that you know, and and then that would that would obviously be able to to flow downstream. So I think I think there's a bit of an action there for us to think about how we can use our voices to drive that. On on this one, we talked about you know we we talked about which bits of the supply chain are, are most in need of connecting up. Lucy made a you know a very good point about more connection being needed between the mining industry and the rest of the supply chain, um, both in, in in the direct supply chain consideration, but also in the recycling space. So what can, how is that link going to work between the recyclers? What is the role of the lithium manufacturers? How much of the lithium can come out of that of that recycling space? And then I think in some ways perhaps the most important um, thing was we talked about the automotive transformation fund. It's Quite a lot of money um, but if we get loads of people applying for it then everyone's going to end up with a relatively small amount and given the criticality of what we're looking at here for the survival of the UK car manufacturing industry is there a point in pulling together a consortium here we're working with the automotive council to look at identifying where we think additional funding sources should be directed to uh, to enable this supply chain to be built up back to you David so I mean, we, we talked through the existing, the, the one thing is that we had Reese, so we did a lot of rules of origin thing. I mean, uh, we're going to find out from Reese uh, how we get people uh, connected to government. So if they have very specific questions, they can do it. So that was important. Um, but then when we when we talked about the, what we do next, it's, it, uh, and it's just sort of an, another version of something Andy just talked about. It's, it's connectivity, it's knowing who does what within the the slight supply chain and a potential supply chain. Um, there was a, a really good push on where are we going to get the money to do for this. We do recognise the ATF uh, as, as a somebody to get involved in and talk to, and maybe get Julian to talk at a future one of these. But the, the general point is that to do things as quickly as we need to do them, it's going to require a lot more money than is currently in in circulation. So yeah, big money thing. Um, and then the, the point about that balancing between what we do now and what we do next, uh, you know, number of people uh, make materials or components of batteries. They need to know where the future of the, um, the technologies is going so that they're building the materials that the, plant, the, the factories of five and 10 years out need. And then a big, big thing about recycling, um, uh, which Sheena are coming up with the obvious point that, that uh, that we always forget. You can use other things uh, to do with batteries and the second life idea is there before we actually resort to pulling them to pieces and recycling them down to the brass uh, knuckles. So so um, thank you to everybody, uh, all of whom, with the exception, two or three people have, have gone on to um, names rather than things. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you particularly to Ian, uh, Reese, and Lucy for talking. Thank you to Robin and Andy for co-chairing and thank you to all the SCI colleagues for doing all the, the hard work behind uh, and being the sort of the legs underneath the swan-like beings that are Robin and, and Andy and me. Um, we will probably uh, put together another one of those in a couple of months. We've got a list of things that we think you're interested in. Um, we will therefore sort of try and satisfy those. I think the theme of you know the, the opportunity and the drivers this time was good. Uh, so we'll try and, and do something about where, like where the money comes from and how we get more connected and things like that. But uh, in the meanwhile, uh, with three minutes to spare, unless anybody else wants to say anything really impactful, I suggest we uh, log off and thank you once again. David, I, I do. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. it, it's extremely quick. Um, we mentioned the UK competitiveness. Uh, I said I would look at where it was published, and we haven't published it yet. We're probably going to publish it later in the year. But as a summary, if this works, so for all your recording, um, that was the slide of the UK, Germany, China cost comparison and, and where the breakdown would be. So that means anyone that looks at the video can, can have a look at that slide, and, uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and, and also, I think Sheena mentioned a report on testing as well, which we'll try and get the details of and put around in, in the, the post meeting. Um, such. And as I say, it'll be two or three days while we clean up the, uh, the, 
uh, the video and then it'll be up on the SCI uh, channel. Uh, so once again, thank you very much indeed and uh, have a good almost afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.